Today we're going to talk about heat exchanger analysis uh, using log mean temperature difference method, LMTD. And we're going to take a look at overall types of heat exchangers. So uh, heat exchangers involve heat transfer between two fluids separated by a solid surface. So let me start measuring this, heat exchangers. involve heat exchange between two fluids separated by a solid. And they are classified according to their configuration. So uh, typical data exchanger examples we're gonna cover uh, in this uh, session would be concentric two pit exchangers. That they divide into two different types of parallel and counter flow types. So parallel flow and counter flow. And what do we mean by that? In concentric tube exchangers, you have two in tube exchangers. So a smaller tube, the smaller diameters inside carrying first fluid, let's say a hot fluid, going into the T-hot inlet and leaving at end of it, at the, so we call it T-hot outlet as a temperature. And another fluid, the lower temperature, let's say, you can go parallel to this. So T-cold and in and leave T-cold and out. So we can have a parallel flow counter concentric tube exchanger or the cold flow can go in the opposite direction of the hot flow in and leave. So we have a counter flow because hot flow and cold flow are basically uh, in, a in a counter flow direction. We also have a cross flow heat exchanger type, That's another type, cross flow heat exchangers that uh, for cross flow over the tubes fluid motion hence mixing in transverse direction is prevented by thin tubes and which they influence the mixing to improve the heat transfer. Another type uh, popular in industry is shell and tube heat exchanger shell and tube heat exchangers. Then you have a shell that carry one fluid and inside it has tubes that inside the tubes you have the second fluid, hot or cold, and there are bad fluids to improve the mixing turbulence to have a heat exchange maximum between the two fluids. Another type are compact heat exchangers. Compact heat exchangers. Why do you use to achieve large heat transfer rate per unit volume for both fluids and gases? Uh, then especially with both fluids are gases, eh? Uh, their large surface area per unit volume is the unique configuration of these types. So today, this session, we're going to mostly focus on concentric tube heat exchangers, so both parallel flow and counter flow. In heat exchanger, uh, we're going to define the parameter called 
overall heat transfer coefficient that we show it with a U um, and U combines the convection and conduction conduction on both sides and conduction within the surface between the two floors so uh, let's look at the case that we have a concentric tube so this is an inner tube and it's inside a larger outer tube so one floor goes inside and other floor let's say this is a counter flow direction so cold flow coming out hot flow goes in in one end so the overall heat transfer coefficient is defined as one over u a one over u a is equal to one over u a for the cold fluid and also is equal to one over u a for the hot fluid and is equal to one over heat transfer coefficient times surface area of the surface surface uh, between the two fluids of the cold fluid plus resistance of the wall of the surface area between the two fluids that I'm showing you this blue color plus one over H A for the hot side as well. Now, in most of the cases, uh, heat exchangers are made from material with a very high thermal conductivity, and the thickness of the surface separating the cold and hot fluids are so thin that this R value can go to zero for those cases. So we can go ahead. Uh, re, uh, rewrite this equation as 1 over ua equal to 1 over h times a for the cold fluid plus 1 over h a for the hot fluid and since those a's are the same and these are the area of the surface of the heat exchanger separating both fluids which remains the same for all of them so in at the end you can define overall heat transfer coefficient u as one over h for the cooled or hot or we can call it inner plus one over h out of the other floor so Let's remember this relation and derivation for overall heat transfer coefficient when the thickness of the uh, surface separating floors are so thin and K is so high that we can ignore the resistance by conduction um, plus assuming this is a clean and unthin surfaces for now. So this way we can find U that Later, we're going to see how we can use overall heat transfer coefficient U to design a heat exchanger. So let's put U here as overall heat transfer coefficient. Now, let's do the energy balance for a typical concentric tube heat exchanger. So let's talk about overall energy balance. For heat exchangers. Let's assume we have a, such a heat exchanger that on one side, 
hot floors, at the rate of mass flow rate of m dot, m dot sub h, and enthalpy of i sub h, so i here stands for enthalpy at the inlet, and temperature of hot flow that inlet comes in and leaves at this point at the enthalpy of HO and temperature of hot outgoing. On the other side, let's assume cold fluid comes in from the same side at the mass flow rate of M dot sub C and enthalpy of cold fluid inlet and temperature of cold fluid inlet and leaves at enthalpy of cold fluid out and temperature of T sub C O as well. And as you have noticed, this is the surface area between the two fluids separating the both fluids, correct? So if I go ahead now and show the energy balance across this field exchanger, you can have a control balance, a control volume around just the hot fluid. You can also have a control volume and analyze just the cold flow section. Or later we're gonna define a case that we can have a larger control volume across all of this piece of heat exchanger and design and analyze the system. One important point is that we are assuming the heat exchanger is fully wrapped perfectly with insulation material, so fully insulated, no heat is going to atmosphere or around it. So all the heat from the hot floor is supposed to go only to the cold floor. So no heat is going to environment, right? So this is fully insulated all around the heat exchanger. Just the heat, ex heat exchange occurs from the hot floor to the cold floor. Now, if I'm going to go ahead and write the energy balance across the top region only that I showed, I can say Q is equal to mass flow rate of the hot floor times enthalpy change of the hot floor, I sub H I minus I sub H out. So typically we show enthalpy with H in thermodynamics, but in this case to avoid confusion between uh, convection heat transfer coefficient and enthalpy, you're showing it with lowercase i as enthalpy. And same thing for cold flow. If I just show the energy balance for cold flow, I have mass flow rate of cold flow times enthalpy change of cold flow. The larger enthalpy of the cold flow minus the smaller one. And let me say again, the I is nothing but fluid enthalpy. And for a constant specific heat, uh, assumption, especially works for fluids with no liquid to vapor or vapor to liquid phase change. Really, we can go ahead and show those as Q is equal to, so this form can be shown as M dot H. Instead of change in enthalpy, you can just say specific heat capacity of the hot fluid times change in temperature of the hot floor. So THI and THO. And same thing for the cold fluid. If I can show this here, Q for the cold fluid is equal to M dot of the cold fluid. Instead of enthalpy change, I would like to put specific heat capacity of the cold fluid times change in temperature of the cold float. 
Also, what I can do, I can combine M dot and CP and show it as capital C for hot fluid C sub H, THI minus TH out. Same thing here, I can combine M dot C times CP for the cold flow and show you with the capital C for the cold flow. Temperature of the cold flow outlet minus temperature of the cold flow inlet. And we define capital C H and capital C C as heat capacity rates. So this is the overall energy balance works for each side of a hot and cold flow. Now take a look at how we are using log mean temperature difference to put a control volume across the whole heat exchanger. Now in this section, we're going to talk about log mean temperature difference method. So log mean temperature difference is a form of Newton's law of cooling on heat exchangers. And the equation is Q is equal to U, the overall heat transfer coefficient we talked earlier. A, the surface area separating cold flow and hot flow. So the surface area that heat is crossing that surface to go to the next floor times delta T L M or log mean temperature difference. And as you remember uh, from the internal heat exchanger, we covered in class, delta TLM has its own definition depending on either laminar, uh, either um, parallel flow or counter flow. So you have to make sure delta TLM is, depends on the flow configuration. But overall you can say delta T at location one, we're gonna talk more about this, minus Temperature difference at location two, or delta T at location two, divided by natural log of first term, or delta T one, divided by second term, or delta T two. Now, what that means, we're gonna cover more right here. So this is nothing but LMTD method. Now let's go into more details of delta TLM for a counter flow heat exchanger. Let's see. Counter flow configuration. Let's show the heat exchanger as this. Let's show the heat exchanger as this. That this is the area between the hot and cold. And I'm gonna show the hot fluid, capital C sub H goes in and leaves this way. And cold fluid with the blue color comes in and leaves in this direction. So capital C of cold, correct? So if I'm gonna show the temperature profile of each fluid as this. So assume this is my temperature and this is the location. Let's call this location one. So one is the inlet for hot flow and outlet for the cold flow. And let's call this as location two, which is outlet for hot flow, inlet for cold flow, correct? And remember, this is the surface area A we're talking about between the two floors in this 2D case. Now for this case, if I'm gonna show the temperature profile for the hot floor, 
let's assume hot flow comes in at THI at a really high temperature, high temperature. And as it goes along the heat exchanger, along the X direction, it gives this heat to the cold flow, so it gets colder and follows such a trend until at the outlet at point two, it reached to T hot out, so that's the direction. And what happened to the cold fluid is cold fluid comes in at a cold temperature. Let's call it T sub C I and gain heat, gain heat until it goes to outlet, which is T sub C O at this point. And the direction is opposite of direction of the hot fluid. So this is how it looks like. So for this particular case, what is delta T at location one? Delta T at location one is THI minus T sub CO. And what is delta T at location two? Delta T at location two is T sub H O minus T sub CI for the inlet of the cold flow. Now with these two definitions, you can go ahead, show that delta TLM for counter flow heat exchanger is equal to Delta T1, which is THI minus TCO minus Delta T2, which is THO minus TCI divided by natural log of first term, which is THI minus TCO divided by second term, which is THO minus TCI. So this is, sorry, this is the delta TLM if you have counter flow heat exchanger. Now, what if you have a parallel flow? Let me Follow the same process for parallel flow. Also for parallel flow, you have to follow the same procedure. You have a tube and tube heat exchanger. Then in a 2D, I can show one section of it as this. That hot fluid comes in at this point leaves here, and since it's parallel flow, cold flow is also coming at the same. To do it with the blue, sorry. Cold flow also comes in at the same direction. CC leaves at the other end as well. CC. So, in terms of plotting. Let's see how this looks like. This is T, this is X, this is location one, and this is location two. For hot fluid, hot fluid comes in at, let's say, T, H, R, and slowly gives its heat to the cold fluid. It's colder, leaves at THO. What happened to the cold fluid is comes in at TCI at the same location, location one, because this is parallel flow. Gain heat, gain heat, and leaves at some point at TCO. Now, if I'm going to write the Delta T1 for this configuration parallel flow. Delta T1 is THI minus TCI in this case. THI minus TCI. Delta T2 at location two is THO minus TCO. 
and delta TLM in this case would be, according to definition, delta T1, which is THI minus TCI minus delta T2, which is TH out minus TC out divided by natural log of first term or delta T1, which is THI minus TCI divided by second term or delta T2, which is THO minus TC. So this is delta TLM we need to use for in case you have a parallel flow with extenders. Um, one thing to note is that in the parallel flow heat exchanger, in this configuration, TCO cannot exceed THO. So always the outlet of the cold flow is less than the outlet of the hot flow. But in the case of counter flow heat exchangers, there is a chance that TCO go beyond THO. So we can have such a case depending on the design that outlet of the cold flow be larger than outlet of the hot flow, but it cannot happen for parallel flow. We can talk about the special uh, operating conditions and then we jump into solving an example on this. So special operating conditions. Now, Consider the case that you have an evaporating liquid. So let's consider a case that you have an evaporating liquid, which means that we have a liquid to vapor phase change, right? So what happened is that if this is T, and if this is location from location one to location two, we know that phase change occurs at constant temperature. So during evaporation, what happened is that the liquid going through the evaporation gain heat to go from liquid to vapor at a constant temperature. So the temperature doesn't change, doesn't go up or down, similar to what we saw earlier. But in this case, because you have a phase change, we can say the cold floor C is much, much bigger than the hot floor. And because this gaining heat, the other floor is cooling down as a result. So I can show you guys this. So temperature, is decreasing because of this. And so for this case, we can say, we can assume the cold flow C is going to infinity. So one floor gaining heat and you have a cooling effect on the other floor. So the temperature of the other floor decreases. So you should expect uh, such a case. You can also have Condensing vapor, so condensing vapor condition that for T and X location one and location two, imagine you have a vapor to liquid phase change, which release heat 
at constant temperature. So a temperature for the hot fluid, I show the straight line constant, which means the vapor to liquid phase change occurs at a constant temperature and it releases heat, which means that you're providing heat to the other fluid. So temperature of the other fluid increases as this from point one to point two. So for this case, we can say a uh, specific heat rate of the hot fluid is much larger than the cold fluid, or you can assume CH is going to infinity, very large case. One last case is that, so these two cases are related to phase change, which occurs at the constant temperature. So depending on cooling effect or heating effect on the other fluid, the temperature of other fluid changes, we talked about it. Another case, if the, if for some reason, heat capacity rate of the cold fluid and hot fluid are the same. These are the same mass flow rate and same fluid properties, or somehow M dot times CP are similar for both hot and cold fluid, then what happens in terms of temperature distribution is that delta T became constant for cold and hot fluid at different locations. So I can show that if this is going like this, delta T1 is equal to delta T2. So this is when the CH, which is remember is equal to M dot H times CPH, is equal to CC, which is M dot C, CPC. So here we kind of covered uh, three special cases that if you have phase change, condensing or evaporating, and if you have the same heat capacity rate, uh, what's going to happen? Now let's do one example on what we talked so far in wrap up this section. So the example we're going to solve is on a counter flow concentric tube heat exchangers, heat exchanger. So we have a counter flow, we have a counter flow concentric tube heat exchanger uh, is used to cool the lubricant, cool the lubricating oil, lubricating oil. for a large industrial gas turbine engine. And the flow rate of cooling water, the flow rate of cooling water through the inner tube, through the inner tube, which has the inner diameter of 25 millimeter is 0.2 kilogram per second, while the flow rate of oil through the outer annulus is through the outer annulus is um, Point 0.1 kilogram per second. Uh, this is point 0.1, by the way, DO is 45 
millimeter and the flow rate is 0.1 kilogram per sec. By the way, the oil and water, the oil and water both enters at 100 degrees C for oil and 30 degrees C for water, respectively. Now the question is how long must be the tube, how long must the tube be made if outer temperature of oil to be 60 degree. So what we have here is we have a tube and tube heat exchanger. So this is inner tube and we have outer tube. So this is uh, it's not this. So we have inner tube and outer tube. Let's see what I can find in terms of highlight. Um, don't have much option, so let's forget this. So we said hot oil goes from inner side, outer side. So this is oil goes at 100 degrees C, leaves at 60 degrees C, right? In water, the cold fluid from inside goes in at 30 degrees C, at a low temperature, and leaves at an unknown temperature, so it's a little unknown, TCO. And we know the dimensions. Uh, inner diameter is 25 millimeter and outer diameter is the out is 45. So if I'm going to show the heat exchanger kind of temperature profile with the information we have at this point, this is location one, this is location two is that oil comes in at 100 degree C and gives its heat to the water and leaves at 60 degrees C, that's oil. By the way, we know the mass flow rate and that of the hot fluid or oil is 0.1 kilogram per sec. What happened to the water we know that water comes in at 30 degrees C and leaves at a temperature we don't know yet. So we call it TCO. And for water, we know M dot C is 0.2 kilograms per second. So this is a design heat exchanger. And this is a design um, problem for heat exchanger, which means that we have some in that outlet temperature, we know the properties of the flow, we know some diameter information. We're looking for the length of the heat exchanger, how long it should be, so that for this mass flow rate, this fixed condition, we can get 60 degrees C at the outlet of the oil flow, uh, oil flow so we can use it for our industrial process for the cooling purposes. So to solve this using log mean temperature difference, first of all, let's get the properties of oil and water at an average temperature, which means inlet temperature plus outlet temperature divided by two, right? 
So let's get the properties before we start. Properties of the fluid. So for engine oil, now table A5, back of the textbook, you can get for unused engine oil at average temperature of average temperature of 80 degrees C, which is equal to 100 inlet plus 60 outlet divided by two, correct? So that's an inlet outlet average for just the hot fluid. So for this particular floor, you can get CP equal to 2131 joule per kilogram Kelvin. Viscosity of 3.25 times 10 to negative two Newton second per meter square. Thermal conductivity of 0.138 watt per meter Kelvin. And same thing for water, let me put it in another color. So for water, uh, we can use table A6. So let's call it table A6. And we need an average temperature. So average temperature for water is, comes in at 30 degrees C, but we don't know the output temperature for water, right? Before we solving it, we need to know the properties so we can use it for calculation, but we don't know the outlet, outlet temperature. So for outlet, instead of just going with 30, let's assume something for outlet temperature uh, that, let's see what we assume here for average temperature. Uh, we are assuming average temperature of 35. So let's, 35 degrees. Again, that's an assumption. You can go with your assumption. If inlet is 30, anything above this, and of course less than 100 and less than 60 makes sense. So, so we're expecting as an initial guess to water comes in at 30 degrees C, gain some heat, leaves at around 40 degrees C, right? So average of 30 degree, 35 makes sense for them. And we can double check. So for this, so I'm showing you um, approximate. So for this average temperature, we can go to table A6 and find the properties for the floor so we can use it. So CP of all water is 41.78 joule per kilogram Kelvin. Viscosity of the water at this temperature is 725 times 10 to negative six. Newton second per meter square. Thermal conductivity for water at this temperature is 0 0.625 watt per meter Kelvin and Prantel for water is 4.85. So this is the first step. And as you can see, we assumed an alpha temperature 40, so the average is 35. Uh, but have the properties for this at this point. Now, in the next step, I would like to calculate. So, since I know the inlet and outlet temperature of the oil, we you know the CP of the oil right here, and we you know the mass flow rate of the oil, 0.1, I can calculate the amount of heat we are giving to the cold flow that remember in such examples you're assuming no heat is wasted to environment. So all the heat that we're going to calculate is going from hot flow to the cold flow. So, so the heat transfer rate for the hot flow 
is equal to Q is equal to M dot of the hot fluid, CP of the hot fluid, and delta T of the hot fluid, hot fluid N minus TH out, which is equal to M dot of the hot fluid is 0.1 kilogram per second times CP of the hot fluid. We found it from table 2131 joule per kilogram Kelvin. And temperature inlet was 100 degrees C, outlet was 60 degrees C. Degrees C. So the Q total is 85.24 Watt. That's the amount of Q. And remember, this Q is only going to the cold floor, right? Nothing is wasted, no leakage of heat. So, which means that if I equate this heat, same amount of heat to M dot of the cold floor, Cp of the cold floor, which is water, and delta T of the cold floor, TCO minus T. CI, then I can find a relation for to find the missing information, which is TCO, outlet temperature for the cold floor, equal to Q divided by M dot CP plus inlet temperature of the cold floor. So this way, I can find the outlet of the, of the temperature of the cold flood equal to Q, which is 85, 24 watt divided by M dot of the cold flood, 0 0.2 kilogram per second, CP of the water, which is 41.78 joule per kilogram Kelvin plus inlet temperature of the water, which was 30 degrees C. So the outlet temperature for water is 40.2 degrees C. And see how this is close to our initial guess. So our initial guess was, so close to, our uh, initial guess so 40 plus 30 divided by 2 we assume 35 is greater than 4 so we are accepting this one so so far what did we do we first solve an energy balance just across the hot flow use the Q for the energy balance across the cold fluid, so we know the outlet temperature of the water. And we can verify this close to the initial guess we did for finding the property, right? If not, uh, which we don't do the, in this section, we need to go back, change the assumption to update the temperature of outlet to the temperature we found, find the average, find the property, and redo the process until the, what we find in terms of outer temperature is equal to or close to what we initially guess. But so far, no except this. So I can go back and in this point, I can add 40.2 degrees C as the outlet temperature for water, right? Based on what we found. Now, to solve for the length of the heat exchanger, we're going to use log mean temperature difference. So for LMTD approach, we need to find, we need to say Q, same Q that we're talking here, is equal to overall heat transfer coefficient times area, the surface area between fluids, times delta T L M, log mean temperature difference. So, first of all, what is the surface area? Surface area, in this case, we're going to use, if I'm going back here, remember, we're talking about the circular tube 
that contains water in the middle and you have a, an additional tube all around it. So we have a tube in tube heat changer. So we have a tube in tube heat changer. So, but this surface area is the surface area of the cylinder inside that's separating hot floor and cold floor. So our area is equal to pi inner diameter P D sub I times length. Let me show the D I better. So this is our area. Uh, let's talk about light beam temperature difference. What is delta TLM? Delta TLM is temperature difference at location one. What is it, delta T1? If I go one step back, at location one, you have 100 minus 40.2. Or we have hot fluid inlet minus cold fluid outlet. At location two, we have 60 minus 30 or hot fluid outlet and minus cold fluid inlet. So I have hot fluid outlet minus cold fluid inlet divided by natural log of first term, which is THI minus TCO divided by second term, which is second parenthesis. If I put the numerical values, I get for the first parenthesis, I get 100 minus 40.2 becomes 59.8 minus 60 minus 30 becomes 30 divided by natural log of 59.8 divided by 30. So delta TLM becomes 43.2 degrees C. So, so far I have the area, I have delta TLM, I have Q, and I'm looking for, uh, by the way, for the area, I have the formula of this, but we're looking for L, right? The question is, what is the length? So, we don't fully know the air area. So I better put a question mark on area. We're looking for L. Now for overall heat transfer coefficient, remember we talked about it. We can define the overall heat transfer coefficient as U equal to 1 over 1 over H inner plus 1 over heat transfer coefficient on the outer side of the tube. How we can find H heat transfer coefficient? What we need to do, we need to calculate the Reynolds number, use the right equation to find the new self value, and we know new self is equal to H D divided by K thermal conductivity. So this way, we can find H and substitute here to find U. Correct. So. We're gonna find the Reynolds number, so we can find the new self number. So new self is H D over K. So we can find H, so we can find overall heat transfer coefficient for this particular example. So Reynolds based on diameter is equal to uh, we know Reynolds is rho. U D over mu, and you can also, if you show mass flow rate in terms of velocity and flow rate, you can also show that Reynolds is equal to four times m dot divided by pi d e mu. So for the cold floor, let's call it m dot of the cold floor and inner diameter. So this definition for Reynolds, they're the same. So Reynolds is equal to, for the cold flow, four times 0.2 kilogram per second, D 
the pi times di was 25 millimeter, which means 0 0.025 meter divided by 1000 times viscosity, which is 7 to 5 times 10 to negative 6 newton second per meter square. So Reynolds is equal to 14,050, which means that since it's larger than 2200, critical Reynolds number for internal flow, then you have a turbulent flow, correct? Turbulent regime. So we can go ahead and use the Dieter's welter equation for no self number, which works for create a turbulent flow condition, which is equal to 0 0.023 Reynolds d to the power of 4 over 5, Prantel to the power of 0.4. In our case, becomes 0 0.023 Reynolds, which is 14.050 to the power of 4 over five times Prantel, which is 4.85 from the properties of the water to the power of 0.4. If you do this calculation, Reynolds becomes 90. So we have the Reynolds, and so Lusov becomes 90. Now let's go find the H value. You know, no self is H D over K. So H value becomes H of the inner fluid or inner tube, which is water. The heat transfer coefficient is no self times K divided by inner diameter of the pipe, which is 90. That's a dimensionless number for no self. Thermal conductivity of water is 0.625 watt per meter Kelvin divided by di inner diameter, which is 0 0.025 meter. So H for water, heat transfer for water, heat transfer coefficient becomes 2250 watt per meter square Kelvin. So, so far, we found this value. Now, let's go find what is the heat transfer coefficient for the oil. Now, remember, oil was at the analogs, at the outer side of the inner tube. So, for that, we can say, for the flow of oil at the analogs, we need to find hydro hydraulic diameter, hydraulic diameter. So this is what we have. We have the inner tube and then we have the outer tube, right? Oil is just in the outer tube. In the inner tube, we have water. In the outer tube, we have oil. So hydraulic diameter for this case is outer diameter minus inner diameter, which contains water. So this is, we call it D sub H, hydraulic diameter, and we write our Reynolds equation and later Nussel definition based on hydraulic diameter. So Reynolds D is, remember Reynolds is defined as rho velocity diameter, in this case hydraulic diameter, divided by mu, which we can say equal to rho, for diameter, I would go ahead with DO minus DI 
And for velocity, so I have mu for velocity based on mass flow rate, I can say mass flow rate of the oil or hot floor divided by density times area, which is pi do2 minus di2 squared times uh, divided by four. So remember p, uh, pi d squared over four, that's the surface area. So for the uh, analyst case, it becomes pi times, instead of d squared, you have d o outer squared minus d inner squared as a hydraulic squared, divided by four based on definition. So really you can go ahead, cancel this out At the end, you have four times m dot h. So four times m dot h divided by pi do plus di times viscosity. So this and this reduce do plus di. So what happened here, I have four times 0.1 kilogram per second divided by pi. Outer diameter uh, added together is 0 0.045 plus 0 0.025. So this is d sub O, d sub i times viscosity of the oil. G3 times 25 times 10 to negative two kilogram per second meter. So Reynolds for this case becomes 56 Reynolds out. And definitely it's laminar because it's less than 2200, right? So it's laminar. Now, since it's laminar, we need to find its new self number and for this particular case, to find the new self number, we need to go to table 8.2 of textbook. And table 8.2 have the summary of such a cases. So I show how table 8.2 looks like but it should be given to you, or you have access to this, that for di divided by do, you have a column on this point, point zero five, point one, and go all the way down. It suggests an initial, uh, inner new self number and outer new self number in the comment. So for our particular case, And if you divide inner diameter by outer diameter, in this case, it becomes somewhere here. So di divided by do for our case is 0.56, a little bit more than 0 0.05. Uh, so it's, it's in between 0 0.05 and 0 0.05. Sorry, uh, it's, it's, this is 0 0.05. So there's a 0.5 later in the column and then there's a one. So our case is somewhere between here, my guys. And, and the new self number reported in table for our number is, We're gonna use that on the outer new self number. So it's become 5.63. That's what we want. And so remember table 8.2. So we can find the H relation for new cell for the outer analysis condition equal to new cell, which is 5.63 
time thermal conductivity, which is for oil, which is 0.138 watt per meter Kelvin divided by hydraulic diameter. So H becomes 38.8 watt per meter square Kelvin. Now we have everything to find overall heat transfer coefficient. Remember was equal to one over one over HI, one over 2250 plus one over H out, one over 38.8, so U becomes 38.1. So I'm gonna go through the slide back. So we found U. So if I, I'm gonna using this equation. I know the Q. Q is the same Q amount of heat generated from the hot fluid or absorbed by the cold fluid. So it's the same Q. So we have Q 8524 watt. We just found overall heat transfer coefficient U. We know delta T L M. Uh, so we are looking for length, which is hidden in the area. Area is pi di l. So we have everything except l. So I can go ahead and say l is equal to q divided by u overall heat transfer coefficient pi di times delta t l m which is 8524 watt divided by 38.1 as the u with the unit of watt per meter square uh, sorry watt per meter square kelvin Pi inner diameter was 0 0.025 meter. And delta TLM we found 43.2 degrees C. So L becomes 65.9 meter. So the length of the heat exchanger should be almost 66 meter in order to reduce the temperature of the oil from 100 to 60 degrees C. Thank you.